to introduce uh, Ramdas Gupta from GIS, and he's going to talk to us about uh, liver cancer. So thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Al. Um, can you see my screen? All right. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I think it's it's really great to be connected with this global audience. And, and it's great that I'm going after Heyo. She touched upon several of the um, tumor specific insights that I'm also going to talk about, but in the context of liver, uh, but perhaps, you know, also underscores, uh, you know, these meetings or the benefits of these meetings. At some point we can come together to really kind of look at uh, indication specific or indication agnostic uh, you know, features uh, across these different cancer indications. So really excited to talk to you about uh, our recent findings in the human hepatocellular carcinoma, specifically focus on the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so my lab is generally interested in uh, identifying the, the function of tumor heterogeneity and how it drives tumor evolution to metastatic or resistant disease. Um, and uh, the hope is that, that we can identify novel predictive biomarkers and our therapeutic targets, eventually improving uh, clinical outcome. And the approach that we are taking is really kind of to map evolutionary trajectories of tumor evolution, the level of single cells. And we do so both in the context of, uh, let me get my laser pointer, um, both in the context of tumor progression. So um, how a primary tumor uh, progresses onto resistant and metastatic disease, uh, and, and more recently also really interested in tumor genesis, kind of the tumor evolution of the past per se. Um, however, most of the uh, papers that we've published uh, in the last two, three years, uh, they're mostly looking at tumor cell intrinsic mechanisms. Uh, however, uh, we know, and this is something that was uh, touched upon by the previous two speakers, is tumor is really, I mean, you have to think of it as an ecosystem of kind of, you know, widely interacting and interdependent cellular complexities or cellular communities. Uh, so you have these clonal populations of cells, so you have the tumor cells, perhaps with different selective fitnesses, and they can adapt differently, but then acted upon by a heterogeneous um, tumor environment and that, that can impose different selection pressures. And these could be immune cells, cancer-associated fibroblasts, endothelial cells, et cetera. Uh, but, but generally true for any kind of ecosystem as such that the growth and the survival of the tumor cell kind of depends on these interactions as well as the, the viability of the cells of the tumor environment. And, and that's the question that we really wanted to get to, kind of how do tumors evolve in the context uh, of the microenvironment, both in time and space? Um, and so that's gonna be the focus of, of this study and this was just recently published a couple of weeks ago um, and, and ably led by Anko Sharma, who's a postdoc and actually moving on to become a colleague uh, with Al Forrest at Curtin University in, in Perkins in Perth, Australia. Uh, Justine did uh, all of the bioinformatics analysis uh, and amazing Aro uh, Ria who did most of the processing work uh, for the single cell um, uh, work pipeline. Um, of course, couldn't have been possible without P.S. Chow, he's a, he's a surgeon, a liver, can liver surgeon at the National Cancer Center, Singapore, where he got all the samples from and, and Florent Genot uh, who collaborated with us uh, on specifically looking at the myeloid cells um, and, and uh, validating some of the studies that we've, or uh, observations we made with single cells using flow. Um, so the work really started as part of uh, kind of this effort that's going on uh, led by Pierce um, in terms of uh, um, bringing precision medicine to, to liver cancer. And there are many, many moving parts to it. So I'm not gonna go through the details, but we focused on the transcriptomic heterogeneity. So typically what we have is um, uh, the tumors that are then multi, we have multi-sectoral sequencing. So they're sectored into say the tumor periphery, the intermediate region and tumor core, and as well as we have the paired tumor associated normal uh, as, as normal as it gets. And we can, we can talk about this uh, later if people are interested. Um, so, um, so this is what we started off with. So we generated an atlas about of over 200,000 cells uh, we have 14 patients, uh, again, tumors and multi-sectors of tumors, as well as adjacent normals. So that's about 75,000 cells. We also looked at fetal liver, and uh, I'll tell you why um, in, in, in the next few slides, um, as well as some of the mouse liver cells, and it'll become clear as to why we did this. Um, of course, we use standard pipelines to identify new cell types and cell states. Uh, we're interested in looking at mechanisms using conserved gene regulatory networks that may be involved in defining these cell states that we find in the tumor versus normal. And then eventually we also looked at spatial transcomics to validate 
the observations that we find, um, the observations that we made uh, using single cell transformics, using the nanostring GeoMX, the DSP platform. Um, not going to go into the workflow for, for this audience, it's not necessarily. Only thing I would say that hepatocytes are really tough uh, cookie to work with. Um, so uh, we actually uh, included a sorting uh, strategy where we sort CD45 positive and negative just to enrich for hepatocytes because they simply don't like dissociation. And then we combine them one into one. And this is all this, it's listed in protocols.io. So if you're interested, just please feel free to download the protocols. Um, so this is uh, what the multi-sector uh, UMAP looked like uh, of the single cell atlas. Again, about 75,000 cells, 62 sectors. We identified the different cell types. Um, and again, uh, the major cell types, you have the lymphoids, the T cells, the B cells, the myeloids, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and the hepatocytes. Uh, but because we had the spatial atlas, um, so the first kind of really curious and intriguing observation was that we could start seeing these clusters that, that kind of stratify based on where they are coming from, whether they are coming from the normal. In this case, all the normals that you see in subsequent slides are, are labeled in yellow. So all these yellow uh, parts in the endothelial cells, lymphoids and the myeloids coming from the tumor adjacent normal. And the tumor periphery and the tumor core is, is in purple and red respectively. Um, so, so all the non-yellow would be the tumor, all right, just remember that. So that was already interesting as we wanted to figure out, you know, what are the differences in these different cell types in the tumor versus the normal. So we subclustered them. So we first we started with the lymphoids. And this is again, the subclustering of the lymphoids. And as you can see, they very clearly demarcates between the clusters that are coming from the normal and clusters come from the tumor. But what was um, quite evident immediately is that majority of the, the T cells basically in the tumor microenvironment on the, or in the tumor would happen to be these immunosuppressive regulatory T cells, as well as naive and other helper CD4 T cells. Whereas the vast majority of the cytotoxic CD8 T cells in NK and NK T cells appear to be in the tumor associated normal, right? Um, and if you look at some of these markers, so you have the markers of T-Rex, so you have BATF and TIGIT, for example, are highly expressed in the tumor. Uh, but again, if you look at the uh, CD8 population actually in the tumor, the, whatever is remaining in the tumor appears to be uh, expressing exhausted phenotypes, so you have TIM3, LAX3, PD1, whereas uh, most of the uh, CD8 positive cells and the NK cells, like I said, are, appear to be excluded from the tumor microenvironment, so they're in the adjacent normal. So suggesting that, you know, there is, uh, if you will, uh, kind of this is the winter in the tumor uh, microenvironment in HCC. Um, and so we wanted to ask what specifies this, this uh, immune exclusion, the cold tumor phenotype. And I'm gonna kind of jump to the, uh, the, the major conclusions in, in, um, uh, um, and, and because of the interest of time. But, but what, what, what really uh, was, was fascinating is that we found this, this remarkable reprogramming of the stromal cells in the tumor microenvironment. So first, uh, this is just looking at uh, subclustering of the endothelial cells. So we find again endothelial cells, again, very quick, uh, very um, uh, uh, dramatically kind of stratified between the cells, clusters that are coming from the normal and the tumor. And within the tumor, we find these endothelial cells that are expressing this particular gene called PLVAP. So it's a plasma lemma vesicle associated protein. It, it, it changes or, or influences, regulates the leakiness of endothelial cells and, and allows the, the, the uh, passage of uh, cytokines, chemokines, as well as leukocytes through the endothelial walls. Um, uh, and this is specifically enriched in the, in the tumor, not really found in the tumor adjacent normal. Uh, what's, uh, what's really uh, interesting is that there's a paper in 2016 where they looked at mouse liver, mouse fetal liver. And in fact, PLVAP uh, expression is highly expressed in the mouse fetal liver. And what uh, was shown in this paper is that in fact, it regulates the seeding of tissue resident macrophages. So that really brought us to kind of start looking at the other uh, immune cell types, and specifically the myeloids carefully. And uh, again, to a surprise, what we find is again, the myeloids, if you subcluster, you find the clusters on the left mainly coming from the tumor. So these are the tumor associated macrophages on the right hand side, mainly coming from the normal, which has the monocytes and DCs, et cetera. But what's really interesting, we identified this new class of tumor associated micro macrophages, which express this particular gene called FOLAR2. So it's a folate receptor. Again, what was fascinating that it's only expressed in or known to express at least in this case, it's in mouse fetal liver, 
as well as uh, appears to be expressed in, 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 fetal, in human fetal liver, and I'll just show you in just a bit. Um, and they also express other immunosuppressive markers or more of the anti-inflammatory kind of pro-ECM remodeling macrophages such as CD163, CD206, MRC1, basically. Um, and, and what's also interesting is that you can, in fact, they, uh, the, the same cells that, have, uh, that are expressing the SWALA2 CD163 are also expressing some of the, the markers of the tissue resident macrophages, such as the cuffer cells, which are, in fact, the embryonically seeded macrophages, right? So, again, suggesting that, you know, you identify or that you have some kind of appearance or, or perhaps reprogramming the macrophages into, into acquiring, into those that acquire like these fetal-like characteristics. Uh, and this is basically shown by the expression of LILB5. But, but to um, unequivocally prove that, uh, we then started looking at uh, fetal liver. So we generated the single cell, uh, single cell transdromic data from four fetal livers um, and then integrated the data both for endothelial cells as well as macrophages. And as you can see that both in the endothelial cells, you have this cluster five and cluster one that are getting contribution for both from tumor, which is in red and fetal samples in purple. And, and these are the same, this cluster five and one, you could see that they have expression of this particular gene PLWAP, as well as they are also expressing VEGFR2. As it turns out, PLWAP is a downstream target of VEGF uh, signaling VEGFR2, but you see the same thing in cluster one as well. Uh, similarly, we do have these fetal liver macrophages gene expression in, in the TAN1, and this is just showing in this particular cluster one, again, contribution both from fetal as well as tumor, and you have this expression, uh, sorry, in cluster one over here, expression of FOLAR2, um, uh, um, uh, um, just again, uh, corroborating this notion that you may have this fetal-like reprogramming of the tumor microenvironment, both in terms of endothelial cells, as well as the TAMs. Um, so the question is, well, what do the TAMs do or what do these TAM1 population do? Um, as it turns out, this is using cell phone DB um, uh, that, well, firstly, the TAM1 population are highly associated uh, with the regulatory T cells and most of the interaction that it has with the helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells or the NK cells appear to be immunosuppressive in nature. Um, so then the question was, well, what determines the TAM1 states, right? Where are they coming from? What are the downstream pathways that are activated to specify this TAM, TAM1 fate? And for that, uh, I like to say that we took the scenic route. Um, and so uh, applied scenic, which basically, so, so from uh, Steinart's group, which basically clusters these cells based on um, activation of certain regulons, right? And one of the top regulons that appear to be uh, present in both in tumor and red, as well as the fetal um, uh, liver macrophages appears to be HES1. HES1, as you might know, is a downstream target and a major regulon of the notch signaling pathway. And you can see here with the co-expression of CD206163 FOLAR2, these are the same cells that are also expressing HES1, right? And so the question is, okay, if notch is activated, then where is the ligand delta or, or, or uh, jagged coming from? And as it turns out, the delta ligand is coming from the same PLWAP1 expressing endothelial cells. So it appears that this fetalized um, endothelial cells that are expressing PLWAP, but they have delta-4 expression, which may be interacting with NOTCH2 uh, in the tumor associate in, in the monocytes, and then reprogramming them uh, by uh, into this fetalized or fetal-like tumor associated macrophages using delta notch signaling. And we can show this functionally as well. So this is just in vitro assays with delta-4 uh, or nude beads. So the, the nude beads co-cultured with monocytes isolated from the normal um, tumor, all right? So the tumor is just normal and you don't see any activation of 162 or 6. However, if you have delta-4 coated bead, you see there's a market upregulation of CD163 or 206. So the, the normal monocytes or monocytes um, isolated from the tumor adjacent normal, they get reprogrammed into these fetal like to TAMs. Um, and, and then you can block it with delta-4 antibody. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into it, but you can look in the paper. First, we've also used a variety of other techniques that to look at lineages and where they're coming from using RNA velocity. And you can see that there are actually two different mechanisms of uh, this appearance of these fetal like TAM. One is this reprogramming of monocytes that are coming from the tumor, so that are coming from the tumor adjacent normal into the tumor and they get reprogrammed into these fetal like TAMs. But then we also find this enrichment of TAMs, the tumor, which are very similar to the tumor 
tissue resident macrophages in HCC. Um, um, in terms of uh, how do we get these tumor associated endothelial cells, uh, what we could show is in fact, like I said, PLVAP is actually a downstream target gene of VEGFR2, and these are the same cells that are expressing VEGFR2. The VEGF actually is then uh, what we found through NicheNet is actually coming from the hepatocytes, right? And you, you, we can validate it with RNA scope as well, suggesting then that the tumor hepatocytes are you know, expressing VEGF alpha, which then can reprogram these endothelial cells which are expressing VEGFR2 to activate PLVAP, and then they become uh, these more fetal-like um, uh, endothelial cells. Um, so uh, lastly, we could um, uh, validate this uh, using digital spatial profiling, using nanostring GRMX. What you're looking at is about 108 regions of interest from uh, a fetal liver, um, human fetal liver, adjacent normal, and uh, tumor uh, tissue. Um, and we have a, a customized set of 96 um, probes. Um, and and uh, what you see is that when you cluster them, so on the, on the y-axis, just expression, this whole chain, uh, when you cluster all these regions of interest, they cluster into two major clusters, the one on the left and the right. And what you find is the one on the left um, is, is this cluster one mainly coming from tumor tissue as well as the fetal tissue, very little from the tumor adjacent normal. And, and these regions of these clusters have expressed this, these oncofetal ecosystems. So they have high levels of polar two TAM1s, PLVAP expressing endothelial cells, high levels of notch and VEGF signaling. And they have these Tregs and a whole host of upregulated um, uh, exhaustion markers, such as uh, TIM3, LAD3, PD1, et cetera. Um, so that brings me to our working model. Um, so we think what's happening in the tumor microenvironment, you have these hepatocytes, uh, and it's really only dividing hepatocytes, which is quite curious uh, that they, they start expressing VEGF alpha which then interacts with VEGFR2 and the endothelial cells and reprogram them into these fetal-like PLVAP um, endothelial cells, some of which would be expressing Delta IV, which then recruit the blood monocytes from the tumor adjacent normal, basically, and then reprogram them into these fetal-like polar II positive TAMs. These then engage in um, immunosuppressive interactions with the helper cells and the, and the cytotoxic T cells, as well as um, highly associated with, with the regulatory T cells, perhaps recruit them um, into the tumor microenvironment, keeping and therefore kind of regenerating this, this fetal-like immunotolerant tumor microenvironment. Um, so overall, uh, I would say like, you know, one thing that we are really fascinated with and we are gonna follow up on, we are now following up on this, is really to try to understand that this, the, the similarities and what's the mechanism, the reasoning behind um, this cancer perhaps being an echo of the fetal pus. Um, of course, it makes sense. Um, uh, in fact, there's this remarkable similarity in the fetal maternal interface and the tumor microenvironment and has been suggested in the literature. If you look at the vast majority of genes, especially the ones in the tumor microenvironment, they're highly conserved in the tumor and the desidua um, right next to the cytotrophic glass in the placenta. Uh, and in fact, functionally as well, it's been shown, uh, this is again a decade old paper, uh, from uh, Jan uh, Unruh's group, um, where they uh, did microarrays actually on the desidual macrophages. And if you, and, and again, over here, right? And if you look at some of the top markers uh, that were expressed in the desidual macrophages, or those macrophages could also be differentiated using IL-10 and GM-CSF uh, or MCSF. They start expressing exactly the same markers that we find in the fetal like TAMs um, in our HCC data. Um, and many of them, of course, are really important to drive some of these hall hallmarks of cancer, but as well as really important fetal development. So that's something that we're going to follow up um, in the future. Um, and in terms of uh, clinical relevance, I think it has really important consequences for combinatorial immunotherapy. Uh, this is a paper that came out a couple of months ago in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, in HCC, not much really works. However, in this particular study, which is the Roche drug of anti-PD-1, the TESO, together with bevacizumab, which is a vascular anti-VEGF. And that seemed to have quite a remarkable response in HCC. And we think that perhaps this combination of say anti-VEGF, uh, the way this could be beneficial is that maybe it is blocking the emergence of these fetalized PLV positive endothelial cells, which will then no longer reprong the macrophages into these immunosuppressive macrophages. And therefore it can um, uh, you know, maybe convert this 
this microenvironment from winter to spring. And at that point, if you add anti-PD-1, um, your response rates would go up. So obviously we're now trying to look to see if we can use them as biomarkers or as potential therapeutic targets. A lot to do, of course, um, in the future. So, all right, so I'll end there um, uh, by thanking, of course, uh, patients, most importantly, who donated all these tissues uh, for, for research. Clinicians, uh, we have amazing clinicians and we haven't, didn't get the chance to talk about uh, much of the other work that we're doing um, in colorectal cancers, um, in nasopharyngeal cancers and oral cancers and breast cancers. Uh, these are, again, some of the DZ Lab uh, kind of superheroes who are doing all this fantastic work and allow me to talk about uh, their amazing work. And of course, um, uh, HEA and, and CVI, who's funding part of the liver project. Um, happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ram. That was fantastic, as usual. Um, so uh, we haven't got any questions come through on the Q&A yet. So if you've got any, please type them in now. Um, so you mentioned that the hepatocytes were a tough uh, task. So you, you were sorting to get, get, get intact uh, hepatocytes. Have you tried single nuclei um, for hepatocytes? Yeah. Really good question. Actually, we will. We are. We we definitely want to. Uh, we are also going to look at um, ataxic actually, because um, in terms of in addition to just inferring gene regulatory networks, we want to directly look at that. And so that's actually happening right now, uh, but don't have data yet, so can't say for sure. But that's exactly where we want to go. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I'll keep on asking questions, but if the panelists got any, sure. jump in. Um, so you, you use cell phone DB and you also use NicheNet. Um, and in the end, you've got a model that's got uh, VEGFA to VEGFA, DLL4 to Notch2, a PDL1, et cetera. There's single ligand receptor pairs between these particular cell types. Um, are there other pairs that are important, do you think, for example, between the hepatocytes and the, the, the blue cells? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, so, you know, I think, so the thing is in the blue cells, what we found that the highest expression was really VEGFR2. Uh, there wasn't as much of the expression of VEGFR1, for example, uh, which is why that's, that's what we think is happening. Of course, you know, this is something that we would love to functionally test if there are good mouse models, but uh, the, the issue with working with any of these human samples is that, you know, uh, tough to do any kind of downstream functional validation. Um, but but uh, but uh, in terms of uh, delta four, uh, it was amongst the, so there was no jagged expression, and amongst the delta delta ligand expression, delta four was the top one. And monocytes actually are known to express notch two, very high levels of notch two. We mm -hmm. don't see expression of other notch um, uh, receptors, uh, which is why we think it is really this interaction delta four notch two, and and that's something that we could at least. Uh, test with the um, co-culture assays in, in vitro. Um, but this is not to say that this, this is clearly not an exhaustive list of interactions. There are many other interactions that are also happening between hepatocytes and endothelial cells and endothelial cell mac macrophages. Uh, but these are the ones that we focused on initially. Yeah. Cool. Can I ask questions? Yes, yeah, okay. sure. So is there a way that you can reprogram the uh, macrophage TAM1 types or is it rather uh, educating newcomers? Yeah, so, so you mean from a therapeutic standpoint? Yes. Yeah, so that's something that I'm kind of really interested in. Like, so can we kind of block the differentiation of these monocytes into these kind of macrophages? I mean, this is going back to, I mean, you know, people have tried this with CSFR when are blocking antibodies and things. Yeah, the monotherapy, it hasn't quite worked well. And these were like, you know, again, papers 10 years ago. But I think now that we understand a little bit more, a little bit better, and maybe we could start thinking of combining uh, some of these uh, other kinds of inhibitory um, strategies, right? So maybe blocking some of these monocyte ma differentiation or maturation into these immunosuppressive macrophages combined with mm. uh, anti-PD-1. Uh, or the other thing, like you said, that yeah, maybe with certain chemokine cytokines, just um, you know, maybe activating a more of a M1. I know immunologists don't really like talking about M1, M2, but more of a pro-inflammatory. But then you know, well, liver is highly inflamed anyway, so 
I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea because, of course, there's a lot of fibrosis and, and you know, this typically comes from cirrhotic livers. But, but I do think as a preventative, right? So firstly, like some of these markers, we would love to see like how many of the cirrhotic patients, right, that, that actually progressed onto HCC had some of these markers, right? So can you predict who's going to progress to, to HCC? And because of that, can we somehow block it with, you know, I don't know, as a preventative, yeah, these macrophage blocks or, or maybe just, I don't know, baby avastins. <laughs> so we don't know. Yeah. But, but those are uh, exactly the questions that we want to look at. Um, so at this point, what we are also doing is uh, going all the way from kind of steatosis to steatohepatitis, so, you know, and to cirrhosis, uh, early and advanced cirrhosis and, and HCC. So we are mapping the entire trajectories of, of liver damage. Um, and one thing I didn't get the time to talk about is that, in fact, we've looked at cirrhosis and we find the same markers in endothelial cells and macrophages, suggesting it's, it's really a wound healing response. I think it's a damage response that you see, which then um, educates the microenvironment and kind of primes it for, for carcinogenesis to, to, to happen. You still need the malignant hepatocytes, still needs a mutation in the hepatocytes, but the environment is already there to support uh, tumor cells. Okay, and I think we've got a final question from Wen Yang. Yeah, hey, um, yeah actually, I will ask you, this, is it same for other uh, metastatic liver cancer too? I mean, if the, the other type of the cells migrate into the liver and they're going to be changing the TME, it should be the same. Or that's, the yeah, that, that's where we need to collaborate and look at it together. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, we do have some evidence to believe that. Uh, there are some samples that are uh, colorectal cancer metastasis into the liver, but uh, I, I do believe that it's a priming of the microenvironment uh, somewhat that, that results. So it's a seed versus soil hypothesis. And, and I do think that the changes in the soil that, that uh, readies you know, the environment to, to accept tumor cells in some ways, yeah. But it's something that, you know, we should have, this is, these are things that we could perhaps do as part of the HCA Asia Cancer Initiative, yeah. Okay, so uh, we, we do have another question, but I think we're gonna run out of time. Um, for those of you who wanna move on, move across to the flash talks, they're about to start in the, back in the plenary room. Um, we'd like to thank uh, invited speakers. So um, thank you, Ram, Hayok, and Yutaka-san, and my co-chair, Wun Young. Thank you very much. I hope to see you all physically next year somewhere. Um, Looking forward uh, to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and actually, Ram, just one last question from Kwon Nguyen from Brisbane. Um, this is one I probably need to think about for tomorrow. Do you think cell-to-cell -cell interactions inferred from single cell data can produce many possible interactions that may not be real? Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> how do you select the good ones? I, I, I think, which is why I don't believe, uh, I have to say, I don't believe any of these interactions, inferred interactions, unless I can validate it with spatially, with antibody screenings and ideally functionally. So there's a lot of interactions that are just crap and you really need to go back and test it with multiple different ways. So which is why like not just cell phone DB, but if it's ligand receptor interactions together with activity of say downstream target genes, right? And mm -hmm. the cells are in the neighborhood of each other, I would likely believe that. So the cells are like really far away, like, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, these, it's a really good question. I think there are a lot of inferred interactions, but one has to be extremely careful as to what you want to believe and but you have to follow it up with again go back to the you know basic biology and start testing them yeah okay thank you very much okay i think we should end the session now all right great thank you so much ciao ciao, <laughs> ciao, ciao.